You are listening to the Techie Leadership Show with Bogdan and Andre. Hello and welcome to the Techie Leadership Show. Today with me I have Boris Gorelik. He's a data scientist, algorithm developer, and data visualization enthusiast and occasional lecturer. He has been solving data intense problems since 2001. So he has a lot of experience of working on tough problems to solve. Hi, Boris. How are you? Hello. I am fine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do you want to add something else? Yes. So in addition to being an occasional lecturer, I also teach a little bit data visualization, like once a week, all data visualization and uh, some statistics to college students. And I like it very much. Nice. Yeah, this is good. So we also get like a sort of academic view on leadership or someone that's more involved with academia. So I'm really excited about uh, finding okay. out some uh, some leadership success and fail stories from you. Uh, with that in mind, with which one would you like to start? Would you want to start with the success or uh, the failure story? Um, let's start with the success, but uh, I have to warn you, um, my own leadership career was pretty, uh, pretty short, like okay. in, in terms of, um, in terms of, um, classical leadership, like being a manager. So at one point in my career, I was appointed the head of bioinformatics and software in a biotech company. Okay. And I served in this position for th two years or maybe three years. And the thing is that most of the time, the entire bioinformatics and software uh, team was me and uh, one person doing QA for half time. So, and uh, then I, I got another uh, person to work with me and then the company had to shut down. So that was it. <laughs> and during okay. that experience, yeah, I realized that manage, actually managing people is not for me. It was not for me because... Okay, that's uh, good. Yeah, because... Uh, so at that specific company, I had maybe one of the best uh, managers that I had in my career. And I saw her uh, working and I saw how... I worked and I just, it just, I realized it was completely different types of work and I enjoyed the hands on work much better. Okay, so more the technical part. Yes, yes. And so, but the, the fact that I, I really liked how uh, my manager used to manage me, uh, and her name is Ilana Belzer, is that. She was uh, so I'm I'm a, I was a bioinformatician. I was a data person, and she, by trade, she was a, a biologist, and she didn't understand uh, almost nothing. She understood almost nothing about data and statistics and uh, and the machine learning uh, algorithms I was using. So one uh, would be afraid that in that case the manager would like intervene too much and and, and micromanage too, okay. and in that case yes. it was completely different so the message was uh, it's okay you can experiment whatever you do uh, whatever you, however you like i trust that you will uh, do a good job and it was so, so empowering i mean it was a huge like learning experience and uh, both professional and how to deal in the company um, yeah so this is the the best managing experience I have witnessed with my eyes. Okay. So yeah. it's uh, that, that's something that I hear like a, a lot from uh, from people that are um, especially technical people, they really enjoy when uh, managers uh, they give them enough leeway to to do their job they just formulate like the what's the objective what's the overarching goal and let get it and then let you do it and get uh, get it done it's uh, it's something that really works and it was good that uh, in this case your manager was wise enough especially realizing i don't have enough uh, 
technical knowledge to know exactly what I should, should look for. I said, okay, I'll trust you and I'm sure you're going to take care of it. Right. Right. The only problem is that, uh, I mean, especially me, but I, I know that some other like hands-on people, uh, we tend from time to time to suck into the problem. You know, that like you, you develop a tunnel vision and you don't care about anything else. So again, I'm a data scientist, so I have some data and I try to find an, uh, an algorithm that will do this like huge analysis. And I might not, uh, uh, notice that maybe nobody cares about this analysis anymore or <laughs> that the deadline is okay that I want to do a very good job and maybe do a PhD on this data but we have to uh, wrap up in, in one uh, week and uh, deliver the product right so you know it has to be someone who will gently tap on your shoulder, uh, shoulder and will tell you you know what you should wrap up and, and do and, and, and <laughs> recall the real life. Be a little faster, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you like if you like what you're doing and you're passionate about what you're working, it's really easy to get wrapped into it and uh, focus like on details that actually maybe the business doesn't need or doesn't. It's it's overkill, as you would say. <laughs> it's it's, it's yeah. too much. Uh, and. Uh, since since you're working with uh, you know like you also work with you have students that you teach them and then I don't know if you keep in contact with them afterwards when they go into onto the job market um, are there any is there like a, a clash between what they expect? to to get on, on uh, one starting working for a company and what actually happens uh, so most of my students are already working so i am teaching at the, uh, it's an evening program in uh, masters in uh, computer science so they come up like maybe 90% of them come after the work day Okay. Uh, so they are already working. Some of them are uh, even older than me and have more, much more experience in, at workplaces. Um, yes, and that's why I, whenever I teach, I try to uh, emphasize uh, the point. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you, you, there is the, the, the right way to do it and there is the practical way to do it. So... Uh, let's say we are talking about data visualization and so I would say okay this is the, the right the, the best way to, to create a graph is like this but it might take you three to four hours to create this graph so if this is the final <laughs> uh, like presentation to the investors go for it but if not maybe you can just make, do the 80% of job and uh, in 20% of the time oh. And that's, that's a good yeah. point. So, and this is yes. And when I teach statistics, and then uh, so the course is uh, called uh, that uh, this database database decision making. It is um, it strikes me until today. So, if you go to any textbook in in data analysis, you will get some data, right? Data sets. Yes. And most of them, they, of those uh, uh, sets are very clean. So the data is never missing. The data labels are, is always correct. So yes. if you see a column that says, uh, I don't know, user age, you know that it is the age of the user. Uh, but yes. in the real world, you can like, I don't know, sometimes. So I used, I once worked with a data set and there was a column called registration date and somebody told me that at some point they just decided to change the meaning of the data but not to change the column name so and yeah it was very frustrating but so whenever I teach data analysis I always try to emphasize how uh, most of the time you spend like solving stupid problems and not like, like scientific uh, <laughs> <laughs> well um, there are lots of companies now they're working on 
AI and machine learning and mm -hmm. uh, they have individuals spearheading in that direction and they were trying to get into that uh, market and or augment their existing systems. And mm -hmm. I feel it's something that uh, managers of teams, data science teams should understand is that most of the work from my experience, because I also did some work with, uh, on data sciences, most of the work is actually data cleaning and sorting all the data and make sure you have the right data. Um, the work you, you get to do afterwards, uh, the actual machine learning and AI work, it's not that much compared to the volume of work you have to do to make sure you, all the data is correct and it doesn't uh, destroy your models and get so, all kinds of absurd uh, conclusions because you don't have the right data to train the models. So it's not only that. Whatever, what you said is super correct. But there is another problem uh, that sometimes um, the manager is asking for questions, but they don't know how to ask the question. So, for example, if uh, and 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 this uh, projects on the work of the person who analyzes the data. So, um, yes. for example, let's say you have a, a website. <clears throat> And you are responsible for a conversion of, I don't know, sales on the, your website, right? Yes. And you do, you know, you, you do A-B tests, right? You change the color of this uh, banner and you expose half of your users to uh, red color and half of your users to, to blue color. And then you ask your data, uh, data person which uh, color uh, uh, con uh, uh, brings more sales. Okay? Yes. But this is not the right question to ask, because I can tell you and no. and so which yeah. one is the right question? Because I thought so, I myself no, thought no, no. that's correct one. Because because uh, uh, first of all you have to uh, to tell, and it's uh, usually it's you the manager, not the data person. You have to tell how uh, much is the dif the difference do you is that is uh, is the minimal differ uh, difference that you care about. Oh. Okay, so if I increase the sales, if you manage to increase the sales by one dollar a day, maybe it's, I mean, it will be significantly statistical, uh, st statistically significant in some cases, yes. but it makes no sense, right? So in, a, in another <laughs> case, if you, the manager, decided that the banner should be red because, I don't know, because the your logo of your company is red or it just reflects your um, values. I'm not, I mean, let's say it's not the color of the banner, but the font. You decided that your font should be more accessible, like uh, yes. more readable to, to dyslectic people. So in this case, it might be not, like, it might, doesn't, does not matter what is the conversion because you as the manager think that this is the right place to do and you are just looking for uh, approval. So if whatever you, you, you are looking for is an approval, I mean, you are the manager, do, you, do whatever you think. Or maybe just make sure that it's not worse then. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And so these are the questions that uh, like the manager, the, the project manager, the company manager has to ask and get the answers before they go to the data people and sometimes they don't. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great point because um, like for a data person can know like if if you give them like I want like what would create like a big change for our company I mm -hmm. want like 30% change if the data person starts looking at the data set and says ah, there's not much difference he, he doesn't have to invest more time to crunch out like for like in your example to say after one day of work say ah, this one won but we were only because of one dollar extra <laughs> <laughs> so right. it, he can come like really fast after five minutes and say, look, it's not the, the, the target difference that you say like 30%, it's not there. It doesn't make sense to, to investigate more and do more number crunching. Uh, let's move on to something else. Or maybe just and, you uh, say you, did, you, you didn't uh, like, there was no disaster, but you changed. It's okay. <laughs> And now moving on to the leadership uh, failure story. 
Ah, failures. I never fail, obviously. You never fail. <laughs> no, because uh, my, I as I said, lot, my, so. my leadership uh, career was pretty short. I, I made a lot of mistakes as a data scientist. I can talk about it. Uh, but so one of my managers, and I won't expose the name of the company. Okay. Um, so in that case, there was a huge dissonance between the picture that that manager tried to picture about themselves, like okay. the academic background and, and the publications and stuff. And what we actually saw in terms of, first of all, contribution to the work. So we used to laugh because most of the times that manager would uh, take our documents that we would write do spell checking and then uh, the manager's name to the document and that's it so it was like oh my god no right and and also there was uh, some stories that like leaking the test so that the uh, answer will match the desired answer so it's like um <laughs> In, that, yeah, it was, that it one was is even super worse. unpleasant. Well, yeah, it was super unpleasant. So everybody in the and and the thing was that the team was pretty young and and everybody or most of us in the team would not hold that manager very highly in our eyes. Like it, the integrity was ruined pretty fast, and it was very not fun to work with that manager. So mm. if yeah. So maybe my advice to managers would be if you don't want, if you don't know the, I don't know even what, what, so my advice would be, but it was very unpleasant, but I was lucky it was only one, one, exp so I had, I switched several uh, workplaces in my life already and it was one relatively short episode. So I'm, I'm super lucky with my other managers. I had managers very like very professional in in my field very professional in field that is not mine i had managers who were older than me younger than me and it was always super super nice to work with them except for one uh, that one <laughs> for one one case well that's how you get to uh, appreciate the good managers if you yes you maybe. have the <laughs> It's not something pleasant, a pleasant situation to experience, but uh, uh, you, also, you also mentioned that you had like younger managers. How, yeah. how was it? How, how was the experience of having younger managers? I know that uh, um, some people would be more apprehensive about having a younger manager. Uh, uh, younger people sometimes also when they get offered the position of managing uh, a team and they know they have uh, older colleagues uh, on on that team they might not want to to step into the position so what's your point of view so in this case it was my last manager zirin if you hear me hello thank you for being awesome manager uh, well the thing is like this a manager is not um, so if you take a look at the organization uh, org chart, manager is above the hands-on, right? And yes. in many cases, this person is above because whenever you want a, a rise in your salary or you want, a, I don't know, take a, an extended leave, you have to go through your manager. But actually, a manager is is a, is a different occupation. So a manager can be a leader, it can be a mentor, and the manager can be someone who makes sure that you have all the resources that you need, you know what to do, and this is the person who will tap on your shoulder and, and tell you, you know what, the deadline is, is, is close, uh, please wrap up. And in this case, it doesn't matter if the manager is younger than you because this is like the manager provides you the managing, uh, managing uh, service. Oh. Right, right. So we are a team, and in a team, it doesn't matter because. So uh, you know, I live in Israel, and in in Israel, uh, some people do military service, and some do like extended, like in in army reserve. 
And in the Army okay. Reserve, I used to be the head of the first aid unit. Okay. Okay. And I had a physician in my, in my team who was my actual my commander. But there were situations where the physician was the, the most, the most um, professional person in the team. So the physician would start working and I would manage the physician because I would uh, keep the eye on the global uh, picture, right? I, would, uh, yes. I was the one who would, yeah. So the same uh, in a healthy situation, in a healthy team, the same goes in, like, with the manager and the hands-on. So it doesn't matter if you might be uh, more professional in one uh, space of like in one field of your occupation or not. So sometimes the, the manager is also the, the professional author, uh, authority, right? But it doesn't matter too much. And as long as the team is healthy, uh, that I, I, I didn't... So I knew for a fact that she was younger than me, but that's it. Just that's it. <laughs> That's good. That is really good. Yeah. So, um, any young manager listening to this, if you have the opportunity or you are aspiring to be a manager and uh, you're still young in your profession, go for it. Uh, you're going to learn a lot. I know I did. Um, and it's a good move. Um, right. So, in other way... Uh, if you are speaking about managing um, careers, so uh, uh, my previous uh, place of work, uh, the company was called Automatic. It's the company behind the WordPress. Uh, the, the, the philosophy was that the leading a team is not a promotion, which is, I don't know, it's only 80% true because, uh, right, like I said, there's some stuff that the manager has, like the manager is closer to the higher management, right? Yes. So it's sort of promotion. But at least that company, it was very, in, like, again, the atmosphere was so healthy that you could, and I know a couple of uh, my previous coworkers who would take a team lead position and then decide that it was not for them and then they would step down. And because it was not a promotion, they, was, they were not stepping up and not stepping down. So if you think, like, so... If you like uh, take a conclusion that maybe you, you, you would say, if you think of uh, managing people, try. And if not, nothing bad has happened. If, if the company you work at doesn't allow this, that maybe this company isn't that good for you. Oh, that's an interesting uh, point and an, an, an interesting solution. The one uh, having like the flexibility in the company to step up and step down depending yeah. maybe even on projects or more flow and let people experience and see exactly are they comfortable or not. And it's not making it like, oh, if it, if it doesn't work, if you promote you and it doesn't work, then you have to leave the company because that will make, make it really tough for people <laughs> to take that step, especially right. yep, if they yep. don't have any experience. Um, and what would be your leadership philosophy? Uh, give the resources. Provide some guidance and don't uh, and and don't interfere with the job. Simple. Yeah, it's simple. Um, yeah. That, especially the one with don't interfere with the job. It's something that I felt during my career. Usually, when I performed best was when people would just say, okay, "Get this done," and then would let me focus on how to get it done. And I know by talking with my colleagues and with people from other companies, I know they also want the same thing and they really open up and give their best when they work in such environment, when they have the opportunity to just go for it. Right. Okay. <clears throat> now let's move towards more some, I call them rapid fire answers. So what would be your top three leadership tips for aspiring leaders? Are we allowed to say asshole? And uh... ah, we can go for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't be an asshole. So, uh, okay. uh, right. So, don't do stuff that you are will be ashamed of, or maybe some people will think that you should be ashamed of. Yeah, like in your story, don't steal other people's work. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> Give enough credit and then and, and don't cheat. Yeah, cheating is not don't cheat. Yeah, it, it never leads to something good. Um, when it comes to a book that had a profound impact on you, what would that be? Uh, so, you know, um, it's, it's somewhat uh, uh, influenced by the fact that I teach visualization, but, you know, in, in technical teams, in any team, uh, communication okay. is super important. I, uh, yes. So there is, again, from my previous job, it was uh, the, the, the slogan was communication is oxygen. So I really, I even have this book here. I really recommend this book. It's called Trees Map and Theorems, Effective Communication for Rational Minds. It, is a, it was written by Jean-Luc Dumont. He is also a physicist, not also, he's a physicist. Uh, but he devotes his uh, career now to com teaching communication. You can see this. Okay. And this book is super uh, thick, uh, not thick, thin, and very compact and very dense in information. And I like it. I read it, I read it twice. And when one day I told my uh, manager at that time that I read this book and it was very influential on, on me he told me you know what when did you buy it and i told me what three months ago and he said uh, you know what i noticed that three months ago i noticed the huge improvement in your communication uh, style like in your written communication style Whoa. and he insisted that uh, the company would pay for this book even though then i just i didn't ask for that so this is this book is that good um yeah so i think i will i will give you the link to the, this this book it's an excellent book go and, and, and i'll it. put it in the show notes so people can check yep. it out i will definitely buy it myself especially with uh, after what you said to me about it and being so visible like you bought it and then after reading it and it was like visible in your in your work and uh, in your communication style and it's something that i found like when i stepped into uh, my first managerial role and afterwards most of my time or a good chunk of it would be basically helping my teammates work through communication problems because they they were talking about the same stuff or had they had the same ideas but they were exposing them with different words, with different concepts, even if, if the core was the same. Right. And I had to bridge the miscommunication uh, barrier between them so they could uh, get on with their work. And it, it's, it's especially important to have good communication among team members and it's even more important to have it with clients and customers and sometimes um, tech people have to be in contact with clients and uh, to make sure you build something that they actually want and in that situation because of the difference in background and uh, the technical people they have a tech background uh, they use more technical words and then you have the users who are not that technical and they use more common words to express what they want and it creates like a huge divide that should not exist there. And it's a lot of time I, I've been training and coaching people about how to craft emails, how to talk with people, how, how to behave in meetings. Uh, because we had like issues that were non issues because people were wanting the same stuff but expressing it differently. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, right. So there is a term called uh, the course of knowledge that the, you yes. know stuff you don't know. You don't know that the stuff that you know are not known to others. Right. I mean, so let's say I am a data scientist and I will tell you, okay, well, this data is obviously normally distributed and you would, uh, I don't know your uh, background, but many people would say, what? 
And then I would say, okay, this data is just a regular data. I don't know, maybe just to find another <laughs> term and it will be much better. So in this, by the way, by teaching, but when I started teaching, I noticed that a lot and I, I hope that right now I'm better, I'm more aware about this uh, gap, those gaps, like communication gaps that you were talking yes. about, not, not using the jargon, asking the right questions. Don't assume that other people know what you know. And especially like in teaching, it's even more important communication because you really have to ensure that your knowledge gets transferred to your uh, right. students but it, it and they really understand your communication. it. It improves your communication a lot. I, I know from, from myself, I heard other people who started teaching and, and they also told me that it is much easier for them now to explain stuff to their colleagues or, or co-workers or clients than before that. So, yeah, I, I strongly recommend teaching. It's, it's like giving back and also it gives you a good feeling. It, like, it forces you to learn stuff and then improves your communication. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know, I know. Uh, and Boris, if people want to find out more about you, where can they go? So I have my blog. It's gorelik.net. It's like my last name, .net. I also have a Twitter account, uh, uh, which is accessible from my blog. Um, I, my Twitter is, I don't remember. I think it's Boris underscore Gorelik or other way around. I will give you the link. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And my email is Boris at Gorelik.net. So if you have any questions about data science, communication, why you should do reach out to Boris. Science. Yeah, ask me. I, by the way, for some reason, I get a lot of uh, uh, questions by email about uh, careers, like career, uh, career advices. So I have a, a separate rubric in my blog, career advice. And if you are thinking about your career, you might ask me a question. If I have time, I will answer. If I don't have time, I will tell you I'm sorry, I don't have time. So don't be ashamed. You you can ask, and I will answer or not answer if it doesn't fit. Uh, you, I will see, definitely awesome answer, Boris. but maybe the answer will be very short. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, Boris. Well, thank you for being on the show. It has been a real thank pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. That was today's episode. Tune in daily. Rate, like, subscribe, and share, please. Oh. You can find further info and materials in the show notes on techyleadership.com, including links to the guest book recommendations.